Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, the attack on Ukraine and other forces affecting prices and a tariff hangover has its long-term effect. Plus, the USDA released its commodity outlook. Expectations are mixed. In Southern Gardening, Gary has the DIY on growing tomatoes from seed. And in our feature, Urban Farming, a great idea, but there can be pitfalls. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us once again here on Farm Week. Last week, as we wrapped up final preparations for our news broadcast, what many in the world feared might possibly happen did happen. Russia invaded Ukraine. Needless to say, the reaction to that invasion was swift and one of opposition. Equally obvious, the effects are wide ranging across the world. Globally, there has been an economic countermeasure. For months, commodities had been influenced by the possibility of the invasion. After it started, most were immediately higher before a sell-off. Zach will have more about the economic impact in his market segment later in the show. So as prices rise, pushed higher by fears that escalation is inevitable, some of that increase is attributed to a tariff hangover of sorts driven by a trade war that began a short few years ago. Josh Pittner reports. We're paying a 37% duty on our products while the rest of the world is paying a 12% duty. Um, this week, a virtual town hall meeting hosted by agricultural advocacy group Farmers for Free Trade brought together farm state leaders, producers, and economic experts. Participants spotlighted ongoing tariff ramifications and called on the president to change course after four years of trade war brought on by the former administration. Tariffs are, are nothing more than a tax on Iowa farm families, and they put the livelihoods of our rural communities in, in the crosshairs. While some praised trade deals with Mexico, Canada, and Japan under Trump and chastised the current White House for leaving key USDA positions unfilled, critics noted recent reports of the shortcomings of the 2020 Phase 1 trade deal with China. The long-term implications are, are what we're facing now and, and are much more detrimental. And one of those that I think about most is, is market share. While phase one may have fallen short due to pandemic and alleged dishonest brokering by Beijing, some stakeholders say diplomatic miscues, like Trump abandoning the Trans-Pacific Partnership, have allowed Chinese regional influence to grow and inhibit potential U.S. farm export markets. At the same time, retaliatory tariffs gave competitors like Brazil and Argentina a window to bump up acres. That acreage isn't going to go away. It, it will never go back to rainforest. It will never go back to Cerrado. It will never go back to uh, grazing land. It's, it's always going to be farmed now. While economists say tariffs have had a modest but real effect on inflation, another area of ongoing concern is fertilizer. You want to look at what is causing inflation in your food prices. Start by looking at the actions of few, a few companies in the fertilizer business to restrict trade in the competitive supply of much needed crop inputs. Processors cite tariffs, domestic turmoil, and consolidation abroad, particularly in Russia, for rising fertilizer costs. Pundits warned this week's Russian invasion of Ukraine, a regional agricultural power, could cause energy and farm input costs to skyrocket. But some financial analysts see an interim silver lining as the incursion could blunt Ukrainian supply, dealing domestic wheat and corn producers price spikes and an opportunity to mend trade relationships with China. But for now, all eyes are on the Biden administration's next move. Now for more on commodities, the USDA's Ag Outlook Forum is usually a market mover when the agency releases estimates on the coming production year. But 2022's reaction was less than stellar as global events were unfolding almost simultaneously. Peter Tubbs has more. On Thursday, the USDA released their commodity outlooks for the coming year, and the expectations are mixed. Corn acres are predicted to decline slightly due to high input costs, and lower profitability compared to other crops. 
Improved yields are anticipated as how the industry will overcome the acreage drop and create an increase of 125 million bushels in output and hit 15.24 billion bushels, a 1% gain over 2021. High crush demand and drought conditions in South America will add 3 million soybean acres. Yield growth is expected to produce a crop of 4.5 billion bushels, also 1% larger than 2021. A tight stocks to use ratio is expected to add 1.3 million wheat acres to the nation's plantings. Responding to a dry summer, the wheat crop could be 18% larger than 2021 at 1.9 billion bushels. Higher supplies are expected to push prices down for all three crops over the course of the year. The USDA sees 17.6 million bales of cotton to be harvested in 2022, an increase of 3 million bales from 2021, but below the four-year average. Cotton will be planted on 9 million fewer acres, a decrease of 7%. The USDA sees a fractional decline for red meat and poultry production in 2022, the first decline for the sector since 2014. Tighter supplies of cattle are expected to support fed steer prices. The size of the nation's cattle herd is estimated to decline for the fourth consecutive year. Pork exports are expected to decline in the coming year, bringing lower prices for slightly smaller production. In other news, in a few days, an event at the Mississippi State Capitol dear to the hearts of many 4-H'ers. It's known as 4-H Legislative Day, and for many young people, it's the highlight of their 4-H experience. Joining us from the Capitol in Jackson is Farm Week's Jonah Holland. Jonah, this has to be unique for you. You want to tell our audience why? Absolutely, Mike. It is unique, and I'm honored to be covering Legislative Day for Farm Week. It wasn't long ago that I was a participant myself, several times as a matter of fact. It's unique for the 4-H'ers too, a chance here at the Capitol for 4-H officers and ambassadors to meet their Mississippi lawmakers. It's here they'll gain some valuable insight into how government works and to thank their legislators for their support of 4-H and Mississippi University Extension, which oversees 4-H statewide. Next week, those young people will converge on this Capitol and for several hours, they'll observe lawmakers in action before leaving leaving for an awards ceremony uh, in honor of their 4-H achievements and, of course, their community service. So next week, I'll be back here to document Legislative Day on video. Shortly after that, I'll share the story with our Farm Week audience. Until then, reporting in Jackson, Mississippi, I'm Jonah Holland. Thanks, Jonah. We'll look forward to that. In Southern Gardening today, the edible, a plant growing in more backyards than we can count, the garden tomato. A lot of folks start them with cuttings from other plants, but you can start them from seed. Here's Gary to show you how. Like many home gardeners, I like to grow my own tomatoes from seed for the coming season. It's really an easy process. So let me share my latest tips on growing your own tomatoes at home. In the past, I've demonstrated using core pellets and cell trays to start tomato seeds. Lately, I've been trying to save tray space by sowing seeds densely and be able to start more varieties at a time in a smaller space. Let me show you how. Of course, we need good commercial container mix. You could use germination or seed starting mix, but I like using this general purpose container mix and you'll need cell packs, pots, and seeds. In the past, if I wanted to sow six different tomato varieties, I would sow one or two seeds per cell in six cell packs. These packs would take up this amount of space. Now I use a single six cell pack for all six varieties. I sow multiple seeds of a variety in each cell and be sure to add a label. I'll cover and place on my germination rack under LED lights. After germination, I let the group of seedlings grow until they form true leaves. Removing the plug, I'll gently tease the seedlings apart and transplant these seedlings into 3-inch cups using the same container mix. 
After about three weeks, these will be ready to transplant into my earth boxes. Starting tomatoes like this works great, and it works for peppers too. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Garden. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, the pitfalls of urban farming. In Iowa, those shepherding unused land working to mitigate food insecurity, dealing with landowners needing to develop the land for other uses. It's a classic struggle, what may be helpful from a social point of view, versus governments creating a tax base that keeps that city alive in the first place. The pitfalls of urban farming, a delicate balance, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. Hi, I'm David Buys. And I'm Katie Buys. We know how important it is to take your health questions to experts you can trust. Who offer answers based on science. The science shows that the COVID vaccine is safe and effective at preventing the disease. Hundreds of millions of people have received the vaccine so far with very few side effects. But choosing to delay getting the vaccine increases the chance that COVID will spread. When it spreads, it mutates or develops variants. And we're seeing that variants can be even more dangerous than the original virus. Getting the vaccine is a personal decision. And when you choose to get it, you're protecting yourself, your family, and your neighbors. You're also protecting the most vulnerable people who can't take the vaccine. People being treated for cancer or organ transplants, people with serious illnesses, and small children. So get the answers you need. And get the vaccine. You'll, You'll be, be a, a hero. hero. Hi, I'm Jonah Holland, and I'm a communication major at Mississippi State University. As a college student, I'm young and generally pretty healthy. I try to take care of myself, but the coronavirus, especially the Delta variant, doesn't care about that. It's putting both young and healthy people alike in the hospital, not just older, sicker people. The best defense we have is the COVID-19 vaccine, and the first one has just received full approval from the FDA. Billions of people around the world have received it, and the science shows it is safe and effective. Right now, in Mississippi, more than 85% of people in the hospital with COVID are unvaccinated. 85%? Think about that. So don't wait. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist. Get the facts you need and get the vaccine. You'll be a hero. Time for the market report. Lots to talk about. Zach here with his usual deeper look. Zach? Thanks, Mike. Well, as you might be able to guess, with all that's going on, grain prices going up, soybeans the only exception, while livestock slowly going down. Many reasons for these things, and not all of them what you might think. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, soybeans down 18 and a quarter cents. The reason seems to be a bit of market correction, perhaps decent weather in South America giving future supplies a boost. However, experts also hint it may rise again. Last week's biggest gain, wheat up nearly 56 cents. Reasons are pretty obvious. Ongoing conflict between Ukraine and Russia, which are major global wheat exporters. We'll dig into more of that in a moment. So as you've already seen in our news block, this war has far-reaching impacts. We are in a global market after all, but at the same time, we can take encouragement from the fact that other countries can step up to meet supply. Now, we in the U.S. don't get most of our wheat from Russia or Ukraine. It's our third largest row crop nationally. But markets being what they are, prices are still going up in anticipation of shortages. Market analyst Ted Seifried gives us some insight into this. It's interesting what the markets can tell you. You know, you look at uh, what Russia is the number uh, what two wheat exporter, Ukraine's the number three, Ukraine's the number four corn exporter. So I mean, there's a lot of grain that comes out of the Black Sea area. However, you know, a lot of the grain that comes out, everything that comes out of the Black Sea, almost everything that comes out of uh, the Black Sea area, goes to countries that don't typically do business with us anyways, um, and are also countries that would not really follow along with sanctions if we were to place sanctions on the grain coming out of Russia. So uh, really it comes down to what happens with the ports. If the ports are shut down and there is no movement coming out of it, 
you take away, you know, 22% of the exportable uh, wheat supply. You know, creates demand displacement and ultimately makes things higher. But that's really the bottom line, is if the ports are absolutely shut down, whether they're destroyed or just unable, and, and that, ha that has happened, that did happen. Uh, but I, I think the market's looking at that as being a very temporary thing. Uh, I think ultimately it will be a very temporary thing. You saw a ton of volatility happening you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, sharply higher, then sharply lower. Uh, and I think the sharply lower on Friday was for two reasons. One, you have this idea that, okay, you know, these, the ports and whatever, that will come, that will come back, and probably in a, in a fairly reasonable time frame. But more than anything else, you have China, Russia's biggest ally, saying, you know what, Russia, you should probably not do this. I mean, they're not condoning this. They're saying that this is not. In fact, they, some of their, uh, they took some action on some of the Russian banks as far as their agricultural purchases. So without China's support, you, you, the market was getting the feeling that maybe this isn't uh, really going to be a complete takeover of Ukraine. And, uh, you know, it, it really kind of contradicts some of what we were seeing in the headlines. But, I mean, there's just a very big question mark about how this is going to end up. Um, I will say this, though, a lot of this has to do with money flow. Like I said, from an ab absolute grain fundamental, I don't think we should have rallied as much as we did. And therefore, taking a lot of that back on Friday made a lot of sense to me. But that was conflict on. There's a whole subset of traders, and, and you know, traders in general, too, that look for these sort of unfortunate events, right? And then they look for ways to profit on them. You know, that started really with 9-11. But they look at and say, okay, Russia's invading Ukraine. Well, how do we make money off of that? The Ukraine exports a lot of grain. We gotta come in and buy a whole bunch of grain. And I, I believe there was a whole lot of funds that maybe don't typically play in commodity markets or grain markets that were coming in and very aggressively buying based on the conflict. And then they also say, well, you know, if the rest Western nations start sanctioning Russia, what does Russia export? Well, that's crude oil. So then crude oil was flying. But then, you know, that conflict trade starts to fade away and you have this big vacuum because a lot of that run up was caused just by those, those that that money coming into the market. And again, when it fades away and these guys don't feel like they need to be in that trade anymore, it all goes away in a hurry. Uh, Something that happened this week is that we pushed all of the grain fundamentals to the wayside, right? Whether it's wheat, corn, soybeans, doesn't matter. And then we needed a spark, but we got more than we needed from a spark. And that spark really sent us sharply higher, probably a lot more so than we needed to do in, in the short run. Like I said, I, I think we overfactored in a lot of things, a lot of the Russia-Ukraine situation across the board. But no, I think wheat, even without, if this hadn't happened, and I wish it hadn't, I mean, from a humanitarian perspective, obviously, but the grains as a whole, I think we're operating under some pretty bullish fundamentals before this happened. And without it, I think we would have been doing the things that we were doing, just maybe not in that time frame, and certainly not for that reason. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Seems things are on the edge right now. Situation changes day by day, but market forces are going forward. And as always, I'll keep an eye on it. Mike? Thanks, Zach. Urban farming in all its forms has come much further into vogue over the years, even more so since the beginning of the pandemic as supply chains have been stretched. Many urban farmers have accessed unused city and corporate land to grow primarily row crops. But there can be pitfalls and frustrations for the farmers themselves. Once again, here's Josh Bittner. Monica of Charsky cultivates her inner city community from the ground up through urban farming. Where we're standing was a redlined neighborhood. After moving into a historically underprivileged location near downtown Des Moines, Iowa, the young wife and mother also started the city's first community fridge and pantry, kept afloat by volunteers who share her commitment to eradicate food insecurity. The main difference between urban farming and gardening are probably scale, succession, and selling. The former social worker says fresh, chemical-free produce should never be considered a luxury item. Her Sweet Tooth Farm accepts food stamps and other assistance, shares farm implements with neighbors, and operates primarily right next door. When we moved here, this was Royal Park. The Parks Department actually still owns this space. We are stewards of this lot. 
Her push to convert the rundown spot to small-scale agricultural use impressed the city's director of Parks and Recreation, Ben Page, who says it's a first in his department's 125-year history. She's helped so many people. And I think it wouldn't be a surprise if I tell you Des Moines is not a wealthy city. I mean, we talk about 80 plus percent of our kids on free and reduced lunch. Another goal of the city was to find ways to stop these food deserts and to help people find local produce and healthy food. And you point to this as probably one of the successful things we started that movement with was Monica. Despite local accolades, Charsky's plan to expand from one to three acres was nipped in the bud this summer when another city division informed her they would not renew leases on two other parcels of industrial land she'd acquired, both unused since the 1970s. It's quite a precarious position to be in. The explanation that we were given was that the city of Des Moines just doesn't have enough undeveloped land available for people, so they want to have it ready in case someone ever wanted to build on it. In a June email to the mayor and city council, Des Moines Director of Development Services stated efforts to redevelop, expand the city's tax base and employment opportunities were behind the decision, reiterating such properties are intended for development purposes in the long term. Ofcharsky says officials offered up another piece of land, but she found it inadequate for various reasons. This might sound um, forward or blunt, but it is very easy to make a graphic or a hashtag about supporting local farms or shop local or even about healthy eating. It's much more difficult to put your money where your mouth is and make decisions that potentially are not as lucrative financially for the city, but could be exponentially better for the community in real terms. While her initial model is rather unique to the area, nationwide, many urban gardeners have run afoul of what they call myriad hazy provisions as local governments adapt. When we talk about the laws and the policies that impact how we produce our food, who produces our food, uh, urban agriculture is definitely a growing part of that discussion. Jennifer Zwagerman is the director of Drake University's Agricultural Law Center in Des Moines. In addition to educating the next generation of attorneys, Drake publishes research and information on issues impacting food and farm production. Zoning is probably the biggest thing. And you know, you're also going to need to look at tax issues. You're going to need to look at uh, business issues. You know, how are you planning to operate? What changes if you plan to expand? Just a few miles away lies a pocket of unincorporated county land and another neighborhood farm, Dogpatch Urban Gardens, which also felt blindsided by bureaucracy in the recent past. Frankly, the hardships we faced, we almost just shut down the business. Former high school science teacher Jenny Quiner now sells fresh organic produce to restaurants, grocers, and at her farm stand. She says though diligent and proactive about local regulations, Two years after startup, she faced around $75,000 in commercial storefront compliance requirements when Polk County officials updated her assessment. Initially, we were deemed a farm stand, which kind of checked the boxes. The two restrooms. My gut says the county probably thought that this will be a small thing that, you know, will just kind of float. But we ended up being more successful in getting a lot of people through the door, which then got more eyes on our business. Ultimately, Quiner was able to rally with community donations covering a portion of the funds via a wildly successful online fundraiser. That really was an uplifting experience. In a statement, the Polk County Board of Supervisors commended local food producers, particularly during the pandemic, and said they're open to discussing unnecessary barriers to entry while maintaining fair rules to protect resident health and safety. The problem we dealt with was when we asked initially if we needed these things, we were told no. Quiner says those following in her footsteps should exhaust all legal advice before breaking ground. Efforts in recent years by Iowa's General Assembly to address urban farm zoning issues may have lost steam, but cities coast to coast have turned urban decay into bountiful harvests with support from federal grants through USDA. Others counter land issues which can be micromanaged at the homeowner association level are best dealt with locally. The cities that have really worked to encourage this type of, of activity, they set clear definitions for what they expect. What's an urban garden versus a commercial enterprise? They're going to define that so that when you're thinking about entering this market or becoming part of this movement, you know what it is that you need to do.
In the meantime, Ovcharsky is faced with a setback in production and may have no way to recoup the $10,000 she spent rehabbing the soil on lots the city is reclaiming. But she says she'll make it through with support from friends and neighbors. She plans to do her best avoiding similar issues in the search for new properties, but offers a word of caution. Unfortunately, bureaucracy moves a lot slower than the growing season. Bureaucracy, a challenge for business and agriculture, especially in tightly packed cities where land can be at a premium. Well, next week we look back at this year's Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. It was year 53 of this beloved event, the grand finale for young people competing with more than 2,200 animals and an all-time sales record of nearly half a million dollars. You meet a couple of young ladies who epitomize showmanship and competitive spirit. The Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions, that's next time on Farm Week. Before we say goodbye, we wanted to share a very nice message from a Farm Week viewer in Missouri. Via Facebook, from O'Fallon, Missouri, Mary Crinky writes, Hi Mike, just wanted to let you know how much I've enjoyed the last few programs. You've been giving excellent programming, keeping the news fair and equitable. That's what news should be. Again, thank you so much for your openness and um, remaining kind. It's a good thing. Well, Mary, thanks so much for your message. We do focus on being as balanced as possible with our coverage. With so much happening in the ag world and so many perspectives on both sides of the aisle, that can be a challenge. But balance remains our mandate based on the facts we always aim for the middle. With that in mind, remember if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv and don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next week. Thanks for watching.